Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rosa Cabrera. I'm the director of the UIC Rafael Sintron Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, uh, better known as the LCC. Uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our Climates of Inequality uh, online conversation series with local environmental and climate justice leaders. Um, we always like to do a quick access uh, check uh, just to make sure that uh, your audio is okay. So please let us know uh, with a thumbs up or reaction button if you can hear us. Um, also let us know if you are able to access the caption uh, option on Zoom. If you have any questions about accessibility during uh, the presentation, uh, you can put that in the chat and one of the LCC staff will guide you through uh, through that process. Great. So it seems like everyone has uh, audio access. Uh, the Climates of Inequality series um, uh, has featured seven online presentations this fall, and this is the last uh, in the series uh, where guest speakers have been highlighting how frontline communities in the Chicago region um, who are impacted by environmental pollution and climate change, and more recently by COVID-19, are demanding justice uh, and putting forward a vision to create uh, healthier and safer communities. Throughout this series, we have been reminded about the legacies of environmental racism affecting neighborhoods on the west uh, and south side of Chicago. Uh, with the greatest exposure to toxic air, water, and land pollutants. It is here where heavy concentration of industry and landfills continue to have an exorbitant negative impact on the health of residents who are majority Blacks and Latinx. And in this moment, it is not coincidental that we are witnessing how the highest rate of COVID-19 death are found in neighborhoods with the most air pollution frontline workers, economic hardship, and with fewest resources to respond. Uh, today's presentation will demonstrate the persistence and determination of environmental activist, uh, a daughter who continues la the labor of her mother uh, on the far southeast side of Chicago, uh, speaking against environmental injustice uh, and demanding change for decades. Uh, before we introduce our uh, speaker today, um, I would like to give a few shots out to our partners, uh, the Humanity Action Lab, where the Climate of Inequality Traveling Exhibition Project resides, and organizations, Alianza Americas, and Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, known as Albejo, for collaborating with the LCC to create a local stories resisting cycles of environmental injustice in La Villita, which you can check out in the LCC website. Um, one of the staff will put that on the chat so that you can have access to a link and you can take a look at the exhibition uh, when you have a chance. Um, I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the UIC Sustainability Fee the Department of Anthropology, Las Canas Program, Latin American and Latino Studies, Latin American Recruitment and Educational Service, LARES, Museum and Exhibition Studies, the School of Art and Art History. And we have several UIC student organizations, including Alpha Psi, uh, Lambda Zeta Chapter, Hope for the Day, Latinx Graduate Student Association, uh, the Roosevelt Network, the Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Union for Puerto Rican Students. Um, also, many thanks to our student panelists in my environmental and climate justice class. Um, for today, we have Gabriel uh, Powell, Giselle Alvarez, uh, Lillian uh, Massfield, and Sydney Murphy. Um, the presentation will be about 35 minutes long, followed by a short uh, Q&A conversation between the presenter and panelists. Uh, and we welcome um, any comments or any questions 
that uh, the rest of the uh, audience might have by putting that in the chat. So now I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Cheryl Johnson, who is a resident of Alken Gardens, mother of two adults and one granddaughter. Uh, Cheryl became the executive director of People for Community Recovery when her mother retired from the organization. Her mother, the late Hazel Johnson, was known nationally and internationally as the mother of environmental justice, and she passed away on January of 2011. Uh, Cheryl has worked for, uh, the, um, for people for community recovery for over 30 years at different capacities, serving as a community organizer, administrative assistant, project manager, and as the executive director. So she has uh, wear many, many hats. Uh, so now I would like to welcome to our virtual community, Cheryl. Thank you um, and good evening, everyone. Um, today I'm gonna do this PowerPoint because I really think it's kind of relevant today in what we are experiencing in the, with the COVID-19 and some of the concerns that we should be paying attention to when we go visit any healthcare provider is there's a series of questions that we should be asking. And in fact, that, you know, when we go to the doctor, uh, they don't do a triage or environmental exposure. So uh, we put together this presentation a few years ago and I just thought it was relevant for the discussion that we have today. So we entitled this for better or for worse, the struggle for EJ and the road of future healthcare providers. As we know, we live in the city of Chicago and it's a beautiful city in the downtown area on the north side. And even in the wintertime as we're coming into, you know, that's a beautiful scene, right? But in reality, when you look at, in my community where I live today, Augur Garden, Shula Murray Homes, is an old structure that been around since 1944. And we just went through a massive redevelopment in that area. So um, this is the home where I live at. And as you can see on the, on the left side of you, we're in the community area of 54 within the city mapping of the city of Chicago. And we under the community area name of Riverdale, Riverdale Community Area. Again, this is my mother, Hazel Johnson, who founded People for Community Recovery in 1979. And right here with the, in the backdrop of her picture is where our office was located at in the commercial strip in Allgale. So I'm giving you some historical perspective about the land use and uh, where we are located today. Back during the industrial lakefront, the Cayman Steel District emerged from 1880 to 1925. In particular, this where what the Pullman sewage farm was operating because this is what they was building in my community. Now the waste that was generated from these Pullman cars was dumped into my community into the Little Calumet River. And 20 years later after that, this is when they built Allgale Gardens. We call our community the Toxic Donor. As you can see in the center is where Allgale is and you can see the industry, the landfill, the sewage treatment facility that surround our community. In addition, we put a ledger together to show you where all the hazardous waste sites are, the toxic release sites, the Superfund sites, and the Brownfield site. So, uh, and my mother coined this community the toxic donut. Environmental hazards, you know, what is the environmental hazard? Environmental waste sites, facility that treats, stored, and disposed hazardous waste. It's toxic release facilities that manufacture, process, or use significant amount of toxin chemicals. Then you have Superfund sites that are uncontrolled and abandoned, place where hazardous waste is located, hazardous to human health. Then you have brownfield sites, and then many of them 
are abandoned brownfield sites that have great potential for redevelopment. Again, um, this is what the reflection of the previous presentation that I just did. So looking at it from a different area in the surrounding area, as you can see, this is why we call it the toxic donut. We did smack in the center of it and outside of parameters is all these different type of um, pollutant entities within the two miles radius of, of each other. This is this um, steel mill that is located right off the Bishop Ford Expressway. This is the water recommendation treatment um, digesters and sludge beds that is located in our area, right across the street to be exact. And then uh, a lot of this is, this is what we call illegal dumping, we call it fly dumping, where a lot of people, uh, industry or companies come in and, and, and just throw their uh, garbage in our area. <clears throat> we also, you also will see a lot of this around the Little Cadmet River where people tend to just dump, um, flat dumping occur there. <clears throat> and this is the International Port Authority that's right across where a lot of barges come through Lake Michigan down the many rivers of, surrounding that area. And every two to five minutes in my area, there's always an accident, a chemical release or, or a truck spill or, or a truck flipping off the expressway. As you can see, I showed you two directions of landfills in that area. There are 50 documented landfills in my community area, but these are the last two that was active. Uh, the CID, I mean, the Land and Lakes landfill. This is where you see the back front um, down the road from my community, but also you can see this landfill right off the Little Calumet River. And also in all Gale, we fought against the Chicago Housing Authority for PCB contamination was in our community. We got them to clean it up along with training residents to be able to um, do the remediation of the soil in our community. So, and this is a memorial wall that many people who do toxic tour with us will take them to see this wall. And then this wall started because of some of the health related death that occurred in the community. So people just, um, this is our only commercial strip in our community. So people take the liberty to come and place their loved ones on the wall to signify that they have passed away from some, some probably environment related illnesses such as cancer and respiratory problems. Uh, I want to talk about infant mortality rate in our community. As you can look, in my community, Allgale Gardens is at 33.7%. It's almost four times what the national level for Illinois, three times as high as L for the county, you know, for the county and the city. When you look at low birth rate, we're the highest among the city, the county, and the state. And then when you look at stroke, diabetes, prostate cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and all cancer, you can see we have a high incidence of cancer than any other area in the city of Chicago. My mom, Hazel Johnson, she always said, we've been surrounded by chemicals. You know, our water's polluted, our land, we have 50 documented landfill. We have abundance of uh, steel mills in our community that left really an environmental graveyard. And that's why she said we was like in the middle of a waste dump. And if you look around, people has been dying of cancer and that's really not a coincidence in our area. So basically what we say is that my own neighborhood is killing me. People, PCR, this is our first community, um, um, I can't even say it, that you identify where we were located at. And my mother was very instrumental in working with Obrock, Obrock, o, o, Barack Obama when he was a community organizer. She introduced him to our community. <clears throat> so what is environmental justice? It's the principle that all people in community are entitled to the same degree of protection from environmental 
from environmental health hazard and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy community where we live, work, and play. We talk about ecological in injustice in environmental movement. We talk about environmental racism. We talk about environmental inequities. We talk about environmental inequality when it comes to the way that they clean it up. We talk about environmental discrimination because we, we know that most of the pollutant communities is on the south and the west side of Chicago. And, but we also have to have a discussion around eco justice. We got to talk about climate justice because this affect the quality of life of, of everyone if we don't address some of the issues that talk about environmental injustice and ecological injustices. We also look at ecological justice. We look at environmental equity. We look at environmental quality. So when we look at it, this is what determines what our movement is around environmental justice movement. So what is NIMBY? Do we know what NIMBY means? The, the NIMBY at, attitude is really like not in my backyard. And that's the attitude of many people who fight, you know, outside the black and brown community is that they don't want the siting of these type of facilities in their neighborhood. So we call that the NIMBY attitude. And then we get the PIBI principles. And the, the PIBI principles place it in a minority backyard. And which is, this is where this has uh, been many to practice around this country when it comes to siting of hazardous facilities in community of color. So we talk about which came first, the chicken or the eggs. We know that Love Canal was one of the first environmental victories that we had in, the city, in, the, in this country. And that was in Ni Niagara Falls, New York. But when it comes to cleanup, um, we know that uh, there's a different way of how um, the, the government handled this. So we basically said the government agency needs to be more proactive than reactive. They have been more proactive in white communities like the Love Canal, while in black community, they, re they remediate why residents are still there. They don't move them to other areas why it's occurring because these people don't have, you know, these people don't have much of a voice to complain about. That was the same thing they did when uh, they was removing the lead and the vestas from my community. They just shift, uh, the residents to different areas. They did not relocate any residents when they was doing the PCB cleanup. And for those who don't know what PCB is, it's poly, it's poly chlorinated by phenol and it's a highly carcinogenic chemical, compound chem, compound. So when you, what, what defines environmental racism? It, it has a lot to do with residential segregation, unequal environmental protection, uneven regional developments, limited political power, poor housing qualities, hazardous occupations, poverty concentration, limited access to resources, and food insecurity. So basically what we said, the rich get richer and the poor get the byproducts. And environmental justice is our cry for the defiance against the onslaught, onslaught of oppressive toxin and toxic oppression that threatened to submerge our homes. So uh, just like I said, we was founded in 19, 1979. Uh, we became incorporated in 1982, and we conducted a community health survey <clears throat> between 1985 and 1987. We pr presented at the United Nations Conference on Environmental and Development in Rio de Janeiro. In uh, 1992, uh, President George Bush presented PCR with a Conservation Challenge Award, which was a gold medal. So 
um, we was very instrumental in working to get the passes of the Environmental Justice Executive Order 12898 that was signed under the Clinton administration. And basically it said to the greatest extent possible, each federal government should make achieving environmental justice part of its mission by identifying and addressing as appropriate disproportionately high adverse human health and human effects on this program policy and activity. This is very important because when the United States Environmental Protection Agency was erected in 1969, it was only mandated to work with academic institutions and to regulate industry. Now, what impact industry had on community, it, they didn't have any mandate. So therefore, we weren't able, as the general public wasn't able to get information about facilities in our community, technical systems from, the, um, from EPA, or any kind of grant opportunities. But when uh, President Clinton signed executive or the 12898, that opened up all the opportunities that we as citizens didn't have if we lived it, if we had wanted services based on our community areas. So this is my mom right here with the goal on witness the signing of this executive order 12898. So in 1997, we, imp we implemented the tenant to tenant program because we fought CHA to remediate most of the lead asbestos from our community, but we felt that we need to educate the community. So we created the real project and it was uh, and it was entitled Resident Education About Lead, where we train residents to be advocates in the community, help identify kids who've been exposed, who had high level of blood lead level in their system. And we made sure that they got the proper medical treatment that they needed. We also monitored the cleanup of the PCB contamination, like I told you earlier. We also had uh, we also trained the residents in hazmat, so they'd be able to qualify in the remediation, uh, qualify for the job for the remediation of the soil contamination as a result of disposing of these PCBs in our community. Um, our organization was also feature, feature in the Poets and Promises of All Gale. It was done that Northwestern school, Medell school, where they documented um, the, the, the challenges that we were experiencing, fighting against the CHA to identify some of the environmental hazards in Argyle. We also partnered with local companies to provide job training and employment opportunity to some of the residents. We train residents, local youth residents, and organize in, in after school programs. We also work with the youth and we had a photo justice program where most of these students here, they went to, uh, we had an exchange with Paris, France, where the kids from Paris, France came to Allgale and our kids went to Paris, France and to talk about their experience and to document them through pictures. I don't know if you can see behind me, but I have a few of their pictures hanging on my wall from the result of their experience going to Paris, France. So in 2012, we stopped the coal gasification for coming in our area, Lacadia. And we also fought against our alderman who was advocating for the city of Chicago to release to um, um, to open up the moratorium that we have on landfill expansion in the city of Chicago. And he was also went to the governor because the governor also uh, signed the bill that says that any county in the state of Illinois that have a million more people, you cannot build an, or expand on the landfill. So my alderman was trying to get uh, our government to reverse that and so is the city and then we fought against him. So what is our mission? Our PCR miss mission is to enhance the quality of life of residents living in community affected by pollution through education and advocacy in an effort to coordinate local residents on the issue of environment, health, housing, neighborhood safety and economic equity. That's our mission at our organization. 
And um, we was working together, just like I said, we worked with United States Environmental Protection Agency. And I'm gonna show you a short film. Um, from the, she was the administrator of United States EPA. And this was during the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Executive Order 1289. I know Justice Amigos back to growing up in Cancer Alley in New Orleans, down south of the Mississippi River. But if I could point to one moment at the agency, it was meeting Hazel Johnson in Chicago. You know, many people think of her as the mother of environmental justice. And we lost her a few years ago. And I was privileged to, to be able to meet her before she passed. She was a very strong woman. She was passionate. She built a community around her of care. And she was a fierce defender of that community. She understood in uh, neighborhoods in Chicago called the Toxic Donut. And she understood in Alt Gelt Gardens uh, where she uh, was living the importance of making those safe and healthy places to raise a family. And what it did to the community psyche if government basically said, we're writing you off. She wasn't gonna allow that to happen. And I think it was probably the best tradition of our democracy that citizens can petition and demand from their government protection and clean air and clean water and a clean and healthy place to live. Okay, well, you can see it from here. Almost half of the housing units for uh, for the poor sits within a mile of factory that report toxic emissions. African Americans are seventy one percent more likely to live in areas that violate federal air pollution standards than compared to fifty eight percent of white communities. In urban areas, minority communities are fifty percent more likely to host a toxic facility. Minority community of colors have twice as likely to live next to a toxic facility. So when you look at um, what goes around in the country, you look at Wilmington, South, South Los Angeles, you can see a lot of these refinery companies emitting all the pollution. When you look at um, Harlem, you look at the, and particularly the West Harlem Environmental Action Coalition, they were fighting against the bus depot. If you look at the Appalachian Mountains and you see that the mining that goes on in that area. When you look at Cancer Alley, as she just mentioned, the river uh, where people are still fishing today. And my mother is a native from New Orleans. She was born and raised in New Orleans. So she had a lot of stories to tell about Petra or Cancer Alley when she was a young lady living there. And then, you know, we have to talk about the farm workers. When you look at the farm worker nationwide, you know, the pesticides, the herbicides that they use. And we're not even talking about the physical, the physical problem that manifests, the birth defects that manifest as a result of being exposed to deadly chemicals. When you look at the tribes and indigenous people, they are exposed to a lot of radiation and uranium from the mining and stuff that they do over there. So if you look at Scott Valley, Kusha Indian Reservation in Utah. So when we talk about the role of future providers, we understand the influence of the environment on human health. We recognize the signs, the symptoms, disease, and the sources of exposure related to the common environmental agents and condition. We discuss environmental health, health risks with the patient and provide understanding information about risk, risk reduction. Um, when you look for the role of a future pro health provider, you need to learn to be assist, elicit a detailed environmental exposure history for patient. And we talk about exposure history, occupational profile, and environmental history. So let me give you an example of exposure history that when we go to the doctors, we they don't ask you these type of questions about are you currently exposed to any metal, dust, fiber, chemical, fumes, radiation, biological agents, loud noise, and vibration, and so forth. 
have you, you know, if you have, have you been exposed to any of the above in the past? Do you have any household member that uh, household members that have contact with metal dust and so forth? And then you look at an occupational profile to see if people are uh, or recre or or their hobbies are they working with acid, alcohol, alkalis, ammonia, arsenic you know, pesticides, phenol, you know, it's, it's just a host of question that needs to be answered. Um, question when you, when we talk about environmental health. And then you got to look at the environmental factors, you know, do you live next, do you live next or near to an industrial plant, commercial business, dump site, or non-residential property? You know, like a lot of times we don't look at the basic uh, cleaners in our community and the perks that they use uh, and that we probably be exposed to from the process they use to clean our clothes. And then we look at what are some of the following, which of the following do you have in your home? Do you, you do you have an air purifier? Do you have air conditioning? Do you use an electric stove? Do you have central e heating? Do you, you know, do you have, if some people I never heard in Illinois anybody using a wood stove, but some people maybe. Do you have an, a humidifier? And then, you know, most of the times when you look at number three, have you acquired any new furniture, carpet, refinished furniture, or remodel your home? A lot of times we don't talk, we don't have a discussion about the off gases that come out for a lot of those new materials that be put in the house, which can be a sick house, but we think we'll be buying a new house. So, and then you got to look at some of the pesticide herbicides that we're using in our home for gardening or even for our pets, you know. So then you got to look at your hobby and your craft. Uh, or do you work on cars? Do you live, you know, do, have you ever changed your residence because of your health problem? Do your drinking waters come from a private well or a city water supply? Those are some of the stuff that we have to ask. And, and then the most importantly, approximately what year was your home built? We don't ask those things uh, because we know that for an example, with lead-based paint, we know that any house that's built before 1978 has the potential to have environmental lead hazards. But we definitely know any houses that was built prior to 1963, they do have environmental lead hazards in it. But we're not even, and that's just one. Now we even talking about how long you had asbestos in your house, for an example, you know. And if your house been tucked on it, you know, those can have some, some damaging uh, environmental health impacts. So who is the company that's re supposed to be regulating all this and providing the information that you're supposed to have? And, it, and it's called the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. But many community groups like ours has, has challenged them because there was a good report that came out that said it was titled Inconclusive, uh, ATSDR, Inconclusive by Design, you know, because they're not, they won't pinpoint and tell you if you, if this particular facility is having an uh, a, a impact on your community, they will just try to treat a, sy a symptoms in it telling, in opposed to telling you directly if uh, this chem if this company is having an impact on your quality of life. So when we look at the role of um, future for health providers in our communities, uh, we need to provide community education about environmental conditions and risks. We need to evaluate and take action to ensure that the available of clean air, water, and food supply. We need to link individuals or population with environmental health with the appropriate services. So, and 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 it's everyone role, you know. Um, we got to invest in safe chemical alternatives and disposal methods. We need to advocate for policy, protecting and improving overall health. And we must make environmental justice a, a, prior, a priority in our communities, in our life. So I, I would like, to, I always like to end this with a quote from Martin Luther King, as he said, all I'm saying is simply is this, that all mankind is tied together. All life is interrelated and we all caught up in the inescapable network of mortality tied to a single garment, garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects 
all of us indirectly. And I will conclude with this beautiful picture of my mom, Miss um, Johnson. She's the mother of environmental justice and she passed away. It will be 10 years coming January 12th, 2021. And I'm open for any question. Thank you. I actually do have a question. I don't know if we're going to close out first, but um, I'll wait to see. Mm -hmm. um, you can ask your question. We're going to have the panelists now do this. So you were talking about some of the environmental hazards that are in people's households and in the communities. Um, what would you suggest for people who kind of feel hopeless in those situations? Because I know um, in the last place I was living in, there was a bunch of environmental hazards that I just kind of had to live with um, based on necessity and lack of like other options. So what would you suggest or what advice would you give people in those situations? Well, you know, we'll try to minimize your, your exposure to any chemicals that you will purchase, you know, when, you know, a lot of times we don't read the ingredients because we cannot, we cannot, um, you know, spell, I mean, understand what the particular word is. But if you see a word that you don't understand that, I mean, that you have to use it. I mean, use the basic thing. Like for me at home, I use a lot in my cleaning products. I use a lot of vinegar and water in opposed to using chemicals um, to clean surfaces in my house. Um, you know, we can't stop everything, but there are a lot of, and today we have a whole lot, like maybe 20 years ago, we didn't have what we have available today, a lot of alternative uh, products that we can use that are safe and clean. So, and I know that Target carries a lot of them, a lot of alternative products that we can use. And it's just, it's just making a better choice, you know, uh, uh, for, for what you use on a daily basis in your own. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's such a great honor for us to have you and have you uh, be able to share all of this with us. You know, a, a lot of us are graduate students um, and some of us might end up being educators, you know, in the next few years, as well as a, a number of us have been involved in museums and, and education. Um, and, you know, and I've heard in the past, you've had an interest in environmental justice museum. So is, is there like any dreams or wish lists you have having this engagement with UIC? and some of us who are gonna be here for several years while we're finishing our degrees. Uh, any things that you'd like to see engaged with you? You know, because uh, we like the expertise in developing, yes, we want to develop an environmental justice museum to showcase, not just in Chicago, but what's going on around the country, you know, to give people a better insight to what we fight for and, uh, and how everything is so interrelated to our everyday daily life. You cannot talk about environmental justice without talking about residential segregation, as I said previously. You can't talk about it without talking about uh, food insecurity. You know, you can't talk about, you have to show inclusion of the quality of housing standards and how government allow industry to be next door. For an example, you know, like there needs to be some kind of advocacy that going on in the, in the state of Texas because they don't have uh, land use zonings, you know? So I next door to me can be a, in, a literally an industry next door to me because they don't have residential land zoning areas that don't have commercial and industrial zoning areas. So literally my house can be next door to an industry, which is totally un you know, um, unfair for when it comes to trying to have equal environmental protection. Because the reason why I say that is because not only, see it's a lot of times people only expose, here in Chicago, I'll give you a classic example. Most of the industries in our community, the people that work there live in Valparaiso, Indiana, right? For an example. They only be there for an eight hour shift and then they gone. But if, I, if my house is next door, I'm exposed to it 24 seven. 
And that's the difference that we have. So looking at those type of things and trying to make policy change. And most important, if it's, it's not because we have some good environmental policy, but guess what? They're not being enforced. So we have to make the government enforce a lot of those things, like a classical environmental discrimination and racism we experience right now today is the uh, General Iron being relocated from Lincoln Park to the southeast side of Chicago, you know, right across the street from an elementary school and a high school. Now, and the history that they had several violations and they was willing to and they paid off their fees and fines, but guess what? The city still wants to give them a permit. You know, what make you think they're gonna operate in good faith in the future if they making a lot of mistakes right now today? So that's when we talk about environmental, trying to achieve environmental justice for everyone. You know, it's, it, you have to look at the, the unfair practices what government plays on community of colors. And we have to make sure that we be engaged with the political processes that have an impact, a negative impact on our life. Because if we don't have those voices at the table, guess what? There's no representation for us. You know, there's no fight, you know. And we have, and as I say, we need to not only do the government have to be proactive, we have to be proactive. And we, even from the standpoint of what we call uh, precautionary, uh, precautionary principles, to force our government to use that, you know, if it look like it smell like it's gonna be a problem, then don't do it, you know, and that's what precautionary principle talks about. Mm -hmm. You don't speak, can't hear you. We can't hear you. I think we can have uh, Giselle and Lillian ask questions if you have any. Um, so I have kind of like a general question. Um, in terms of like housing, um, I know that there are like private industries which um, look at like environmental regulations. Um, they have to do like checks to make sure, um, like check on like radon levels and things like that in buildings. Um, is that something that um, maybe your organization would look into? Is that something that you guys are already doing um, in terms of housing, just so that there is like, you know, a, a cleaner housing, maybe raising funding for that to ensure that um, people do have like, are living in, in like a clean environment, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, yeah, um, it makes sense, but it's difficult. Um, as we progress, like we have disclosure laws, like for an example, if if the transfer of properties, you have to disclose if they're lead houses in it, for an example, that's a major step that we was at. Uh, we had accomplished, particularly in this city, because uh, it's been so resistant. So yeah, it needs to be a lot of disclosure um, uh, procedures that need to be put in place when the transfer of property to another person. Because if a person already has a sick child, why would you want to put them in a sick house? And why would you buy a sick house? You know, and why would you live in an area that is highly contaminated? Yes, we think there should be some kind of disclosure environmental disclosure laws that need to put in place, but it's the resistance that we have in our government and in our elected officials and the lack of education and information to given to the public to be able to take action like that. And that's the challenge. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate you being here. I enjoyed your presentation. I um, actually have a also a general question. Um, I'm like Gabrielle per, per, uh, previously mentioned, there are um, many students who are interested in environmental justice and um, my, I myself am in my master's program here at UIC in the public health, um, public health program. And I'm in the division of environmental health. So I wonder if you have any advice for students 
like myself who are interested in working on environmental justice movements or issues here within the city of Chicago and how we can possibly get involved or, um, you know, have a foot in the door? Um, actually, uh, you know, it's just seeing more people um, getting into the field of environmental justice and environmental field. Is, is, is a great opportunity because 20 years ago, there was no curriculum for environmental education and things that you are experiencing today. I just think that just getting involved in an issue would be your best learning experience that you can get. And whatever your passion is that you would like to see, there's something wrong and you can find a way to be able to advocate for it to be improved then that's what you should do you know i i because the because the field is so open the field is so open and and so undeveloped right now to that you know i admire you for whatever discipline that you go into because we didn't have those opportunity a few you know just less than 10 years ago so um I encourage you to, and I, and I also admire you from the age of going into this field. It seems like everybody want to call me now that I'm doing this presentation. Thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a comment and a question, uh, Cheryl. Um, you know, I think the universities have a tendency to, to be more focused on uh, climate change and the uh, global impact of clim climate change, right? And not so much of, on what is happening locally. Um, that is also, you know, part of uh, uh, climate crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. But the lens of looking at, you know, pollution, um, through an environmental justice lens, is, 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 it doesn't seem to be something that um, universities are catching up with yet. I think at UIC, this has happening. It has happened organically. Um, more and more people are kind of like connecting those dots between climate change, you know, mm -hmm. environmental pollution, uh, mm -hmm. the pandemic, and so forth. So I think there is a lot of hope for. Uh, more people to push forward, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a much broader agenda on this, but I have a, a, a question for you, Cheryl. Um, what do you need the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to do more of? Uh, I didn't get that last part, you said with the Environment Protection Agency, what? Uh, what, what do you need the EPA to do more of? Well, one of the things they need to have more inspectors mm -hmm. to go onto these sites because a lot of times the pollution happened after 5 p.m. when the office is closed. Mm -hmm. So the, and the budget doesn't have enough, they don't have enough inspectors um, at the EPA to go out to monitor these facilities. Um, the, the EPA needs to be... I'm doing a, I'm doing something. Jesus. Excuse me, y'all. So um the um the United States Environment Protection Agency should be more resource resourceful for a community that, that's been negatively impacted. We don't get the grants opportunity to hire a specialist to work with us, for an example, to tell us how we can create an air monitoring program for our community, for an example, or even how to remediate uh, some of the contaminants that we may have in our soil, or to, in a scientific kind of way, to do like fire remediation using plant to extract some of the contaminants, the heavy metals that we may have in our soil for an example. So there's an abundance of things that EPA can do for community that's impacted once they recognize that the community is negatively impacted. See, because they be in denial. And what is unfortunately that many community group that challenged um, US EPA is on the principle 
or things that they already know that we have to show that we they already know that exposure is there, but we have to prove to them that that exposure is there. So that's just like playing um, double standards in a in a sense, you know, because and the response time to a concern need to be more expedited than what they used to do in the past. So it's a whole lot of host of things, you know, it all depends on, are you talking about toxic release? Are you talking about confined uh, uh, disposal space? Or are you talking about landfills? You know, are you talking about emissions? And are you talking about cold classification facility? It's just, it's just a whole lot. But you know what? I tell people all the time, the principle of the whole problem is us because it's our consumerism. We demand a lot of the products that many of these companies manufacture for us to use every day. So if we can learn how to recognize our consumption and to reduce our consumption on a lot of stuff that is hazardous, like for example, I don't like using styrofoam because it's, it's not biodegradable. And if kids play, you know, kids tend to like to play with fire and stuff. And when they burn styrofoam, they releasing a toxin out of the styrofoam. So it has no purpose, no use to be in our houses, you know, and they should not even be selling it, but we use it, you know, because it's convenient and it's cheap for a reason, you know? Thank you. Um, we have, uh, let's see. Jojo, there is someone who wants to um, ask you a question. He's a student in the ECJ class. Uh, this is Jojo Galvan. Uh, and his question is, are you hopeful for more collaboration and better policy under the incoming Biden administration? What would you most like to see this new administration do in terms of environmental work? You, you know, um, I know we needed to change and get the respect back to that White House, right? But I, I'm, I'm a people-driven person. The people have to drive them to make better decisions for our community. I'm not wait, I, 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 we, we don't wait on, on government to respond to a situation. We have to force them to respond to the situation. So yes, I'm hopeful because he had a he has a long history in government. And I see some of the people that he are looking at to be to become administrators for US EPA, who I know are good people who's been fighting for environmental justice for decades, which is a blessing. Um, so I'm hopeful. But I, I think it's a movement that still has to happen from the people in order to really affect change in government policies and procedures. And that's why it's important for you guys in school, getting the education, becoming masters in your craft to be able to make sure government do the right thing for the public. Because we can't depend you know, on them to do the right thing for us. And I don't know I don't know why it's like that because at the end of the day, they have to go back home to a community. And what directly impacts us indirectly impacts everybody. And that's what I said earlier in the presentation. Absolutely. We have a um, couple of more minutes. I don't know if the panelists want to ask any more questions or the LCC staff or. I have another question. Um, Cheryl, do you feel that um, public housing or Section 8 housing should be held to a higher standard to be providing safe environments for people to be living if these are, you know, publicly, you know, municipally managed housing? you know, on a certain level, because it's taxpayer dollars paying for this housing. And yet we're, we're having you guys have these exposures at Altgeld. Um, and then there's so many people throughout the scattered site housing that don't have representation on any CHA bodies, you know, about their living conditions. Um, is there something- Yeah, you, I, you know, and, and technically that's what they supposed to be doing when 
for um, public housing and for subsidized housing. When the government is paying um, two thirds of the rent for people to live in subsidized and public housing, for an example, they should they should they should have they do have it. The question is why it's not being enforced, and who is the quality control inspectors who will go outside? You know, it's almost it's unfortunately I just hate to say it because. That's what I love about the environmental justice movement. We speak truth. It's the pay to play. It's the politics that's inside of this, you know. Um, and when you get slum landlords, they should be totally disqualified from managing any development or getting any kind of subsidies from the government when they're practicing, you know, the same. We're not going to continue to pay. You know, we shouldn't use public funds for bad actors, you know, and that's the unfortunate things about it, but it comes back to politics, unfortunately. I have one more question if we have time. Um, I was really interested in your discussion of the students going to France and vice versa. Um, what were some of the oh, lessons yeah, Paris. Oh, to okay. France? Yeah. Right. Um, what were some of the lessons that they learned? Um, what were some of the things that they brought back or some of the French students uh, discussed about their visit here? Well, for the housing condition, for an example, that the, the students, I mean, the kids from Paris felt that when they visited and, and took a tour of the housing that we have out here, they was amazed how big it was, you know, that our houses and and we had upstairs where the housing project in Lucknow North, uh, Paris, France is more like uh, high rises and very, very small, very small. And uh, to see the open space that we have here and to see the congestion in, um, um, in Paris, and it was interesting for some of the kids from Chicago, from my neighborhood, they felt that Paris was a much dirtier city and the Chicago was, you know, their community is dirty, but they felt that it was kind of dirty, you know, uh, because it was a lot of debris, it was a lot of garbage around where we were standing, because we were standing in a hostel and it was a lot of, um, and also, the sculptures I, our kids took a interest in because it was so many in in Paris that was around and that they're not exposed to here in Chicago. So, uh, and the interesting thing, the most interesting thing to me is the language barrier, you know, cause they speak French and we were speaking English but these kids became creative. They was able to use their phones to interpret it each other. And that was the coolest thing, you know. Uh, also, they, they noticed that they didn't have a lot of big cars in Paris compared to here in Chicago. We had a lot of, uh, you know, big huge cars and, um, and the price of gasoline when we was there was like $7 a gallon you know, and we talked about that compared to what gasoline costs here, you know, um, so, and to, to see that people walk everywhere, mostly, and here in Chicago, people use all kinds of modes of transportation to get around was a big difference. They walk and bike things, a lot in Paris than what we do. What kind of things came out of that? Like what kind of like programming came out of that or um, well, it, changes it was a were photo, implemented? You know, uh, what they did, they had an exhibit at some of the French fancy places. I can't, I can't remember the name where they did exhibits and a lot of the um, um, people of higher income came because um, uh, Joaquin Noah, his father, the one that sponsored the program. So uh, everything was expense paid. And when Joaquin Noah was playing here with the Bulls, the kids got the opportunity 
to go to the stadium and, and meet and play with him, you know, in at the um, stadium here, um, not the Bull Stadium, but I forgot the name of the Burke, whatever they call it. I'm not a sports fan, so I can't really tell you the name of it. But um, actually, um, they walked away, um, really learned that, that, you know, the difference in the culturalism, you know, it was unfortunately, we was there just at the time when they banned, when, when they banned women's from shielding their faces and stuff and seeing how the police was harassed arising you know a lot of those women's over there and then and putting them in handcuffs and being arrested just for the garment that they wear so they was able to say wow this is because of what you wear one of the kids said one of because of what you because you shield in your face you shouldn't have to be arrested so and i asked her how did you compare that back to uh where you live she said well you know, I don't get arrested for my clothes, but I can be arrested for my mouth, you know? So that was a major difference. Okay. Um, yeah, we're coming to, it's a little bit over 5.30, so we wanna honor everybody's time here today. Um, thank you so much, Cheryl, for this incredible presentation. Uh, thank you. I hope I was informative for everyone. So. Absolutely. And also for sharing with us the amazing work that uh, People for Community Recovery continues to do in uh, Elgin Gardens and surrounding areas. Uh, and also your contribution to a national and global conversation on environmental justice, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. really important that um, leaders like you, it's not all, only the local uh, conversation, but it's also what's happening uh, throughout this country and beyond. And uh, a big thank you to the student panelists, uh, the LCC and health staff, uh, and to all of you listening and sharing a space and intention uh, to build and sustain collective solidarity uh, to ensure that a healthy uh, economy in a clean environment can coexist uh, mm -hmm. to benefit those who have carried the burden of environmental pollution and climate disaster. Um, although this is our last climate of inequality presentation, um, it's kind of sad, um, we will continue to offer similar programs and we hope that you join us in those conversations um, in the spring semester. If you're not receiving our weekly avisos uh, and want to stay in touch, then I highly recommend that you sign up to receive this. I think that, uh, let's see, Lauren was gonna put the, yeah, she put the uh, LCC mail in the chat, so you can just send us a, an email if you wanna be added to our listserv. Um, also, all the presentation videos all seven presentation videos um, will be available in the LCC website. This is the same link um, for the climates of inequality. And we also have a list of different resources that have been added for each of the presentations there. So I hope you have access to that uh, at some point. And with that, um, I would love to um, wish you all a good evening. Uh, to stay safe and optimistic during those times. Uh, always reminding ourselves that changes are incremental, right? Mm -hmm. So have a great evening, everyone. Okay, and thank you, everybody. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, Cheryl. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.